Thank you for staying with us. Now, if you're just tuning in, we're discussing emerging investment opportunities in Nigeria, and we still have Akin today or your body with us. Please let's hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join this conversation. Tweet at us at Plus TV Africa or at Ways Show Africa One with the hashtag Ways, or send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 081 803 Thank you so much again for staying with us, Mr. Akin today. Now, we have a question from Angela. She says, what is your guest doing differently in, in Ekiti? I think he has answered it. Mm -hmm. He said he's very focused on broadband. I'm happy to answer it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> wait, wait. You it. Then Larry says, I have a challenge with, um, with basics like power, health, that is yet sorted, and we have broadband at the core of priority by some states. So maybe you want to respond to those. Okay, so I think, you know, first question, what are we doing differently? Um, a, a, a number of things. So first, we focused on governance, the right laws, the right the right protection for investors without ensuring sanctity of contracts, without ensuring that your governance system works, not, no investor is coming into mm -hmm. your state, right? So, so, so those are the critical things that we focused on, right? We've, we've created a one-stop shop today where if you come into equity and you speak with the investment promotion agency, your CRO gets processed, your permits get processed, you don't have to talk to all the different agencies of government. And the next step of that is now we're digitizing that, right? So that's currently in an office, but it will be digitized in the next two or three months, right? So I have no doubt that in the country, maybe one or two states can compete with us, you know? Maybe Kaduna, outside of Kaduna, I don't think we have any competition. Apologies to any state. I say that, with, I say that with all sense of, oh, I say that with all sense of humility, right? But, but I mean, we know our peers, right? Um, yeah. And so I, I say that, and our job is to be number one, right? I mean, no disrespect to anybody, but what we're thinking about, I don't think there are many states thinking in that way. Mm. And you, and you see that over the next two years. If you don't believe the story, you'll see it when it's done. So that's the first thing. The point around power, healthcare, et cetera, it's a, it's a valid point. But you need technology to solve many of these challenges, right? Sure. So we don't have 50, 60 years to wait, right? You need to leapfrog to a certain degree. Now, what I, healthcare he talks about, right? You need technology to solve some of your biggest healthcare problems, right? Sure. Problems around primary healthcare. Okay. How do you get vaccines to communities? Mm -hmm. How do you get blood to communities? Delivery how do you know? How do you know the, the prevalence of different types of non-communicable yeah. diseases? These are things that you need technology to resolve, right? So the, the the reality of the conversation is that if we get these things, technology going to 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 rural communities also helps you understand what's the power requirement of that community. You know, how do we create solutions, whether it's mini grids, et cetera, that help those communities uh, progress? Plus, it's not, it's not a zero-sum conversation, right? So th these things can run concurrently, right? That we have a power problem or a healthcare problem doesn't mean... Look, take basic education. If you were to get broadband to classrooms, you can monitor the teachers. Mm -hmm. You can improve the, the teaching methods, the yeah. right? You can standardize mm -hmm. the learning environment, mm -hmm. pedagogy you can standardize. You, you know, there are many things you can do. You can give the kids devices that they learn with, right? Mm -hmm. So my, my biggest concern today is my kid, my kid today, my children today, haven't stopped school, right? Wherever they are, they are learning on tablets, mm -hmm. right? The oh, kids in cool. rural communities who are our weakest kids, they have no access to that. That should be your problem. Yeah. The problem is, look, at the end of the day, the job is to democratize opportunity. Mm -hmm. I always say this thing, this, is, this thing, it's about capitalization. Can a child in a society get to their potential? Do Absolutely. you give enough room for a child to get close this. to their potential? That, for me, is the fundamental conversation, Absolutely. right? And that, that's something that I feel that the more we apply technology to, mm -hmm. you know, it's not, technology is not a silver bullet. Nobody's pretending it is. But it allows us to yes. circumvent certain things that will cost us way too much and take us too long to achieve. Absolutely. I agree. And to, yes. to that point, yes. I was just going to add that, you know, part of the major challenge of the education sector is the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And I think technology just amply addresses that. Because mm -hmm. if I don't have to worry about the school building, which is part of the things everybody wants to worry about, and I can do that remote learning, at mm -hmm. least I'm achieving significant part of my results. Yeah, yeah that's the first to, thing most people yeah, look at. Just give the, the school a face. Which, yeah, and it costs a lot. Technology so or the we, curriculum. Well, the truth, for me, the, the technology part for education bothers for me 
around the curriculum because you're able to now compete globally so with yes, what the, your peers are learning much you interconnected know, world much now. more yeah the competition is global yeah yeah. Okay, Mr. Oibade, Mr. <laughs> o. <laughs> so I like that you mentioned um, price stability, um, monetary and fiscal policies. You know, so, so that just got me thinking. In your view, how can we address the current exchange rate crisis? So I know that earlier in the year, um, when oil prices crashed um, on the back of the COVID-19 pandemic, we all knew that we were heading for another dollar scarcity. I mean, it's almost cyclical now. And so given how critical how crucial exchange rate stability is for foreign direct Investors, investment yes. and foreign portfolio investment. What can we do? How can we position Nigeria to become, once again, the foremost destination for investment um, capital on the continent? Okay, so this is a career limited question. Um, <laughs> so, I think first, uh, so I think first, the, the challenge is, so Nigeria is a very interesting place. It's the one place where everybody has a view on the exchange rates, mm -hmm. right? Um, and we take currency devaluation as a bad thing, right? So people will say, oh, it used to be 100 now to the dollar five now years ago. Five now it's there. like these things are, they're not meaningless, but it's part of a strategy. So if you had an export focused strategy, yes. devaluing your currency yeah, will, will be part of that strategy, right? You, it makes your exports <laughs> cheaper. It makes imports more expensive, but it's part of a broader strategy, right? So there's no point devaluing your currency if you're not exporting anything, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. so, so, so I think for me, there are a bunch of things, right? So one is that, and people always say the Nigeria economy needs to be diversified. The Nigeria economy is incredibly diversified, right? So oil and gas provides 9% of, of the GDP. Revenue. The problem is that government revenues aren't diversified, foreign exchange earnings aren't diversified. So that's where the problem that's is, okay. right? So that's why our FX liquidity situation is heavily dependent on the price of crude. Because outside of crude, you're exporting nothing but nothing, maybe some yeah. seeds, some, you know, so it's not, there's not enough exports, right? So for me, if you are providing a subsidy to any sector, it must be a sector that is focused on selling outside Nigeria. So one thing I would not subsidize is for you to, again, subsidize maybe it's cement, maybe it's cars, maybe whatever it is, but I won't do that to protect a domestic market, right? Because it doesn't really allow you innovate. Mm. What you want to do is General Park was a great example of this. He did this in South Korea, right? So General Park will give you all the subsidies you want, mm -hmm. right? But he will tell you, go and sell those things outside Korea. Now, if you fail, I'll lock you up. I'll put you in jail, <laughs> right? Wow. So he will tell you at dinner. He will invite you to the palace. You eat with him. You dine with him, you know? But if you fail, you go to prison. Oh now, what we don't <laughs> recognize in Nigeria is that when those day racers Mm. Flooded our market, right? yeah, flooded Nigeria. We had no idea what was happening. We just the guys were like, go and sell those cars in Nigeria. Like, yeah. go, and, go and let those cars compete in other markets, mm. right? And so you guys were driving yeah. Dewu racers and Again, thinking you had arrived, and, right? Yeah. You didn't realize that I you were a test bed. <laughs> you wow. were a test bed <laughs> well, for Korea. Workers, yes. Now, what I think is Nigeria has an opportunity to at least first dominate the sub-region, mm. right? Then the continent. Right, so I mean, South African businesses you can argue about how well they travel, but within the southern African space, mm -hmm. those businesses dominate southern Africa, no, right? Absolutely, so, absolutely. so that's where we have to start this conversation from. And I think for me, this is an intentional foreign policy, right? But it's also an intentional export focused strategy. So, your point is we're go always going to come back here, right? So, what we're dealing with now are, are symptoms, right? So, yeah. We'll come back here in three years, you know, if there's another run, the same thing is another. going to happen. Absolutely. You know, you're, you're, you can't use more, more than $300 on your card. Hmm. You know, all these and things... it's bothersome. No, right? these things are... The so they, they, foc they, they focus on the symptoms. But the point is, if you are... Look, a devaluation is not necessarily like a silver bullet answer, right? Mm -hmm. So the point is, what else are you doing outside of that? If you ask me, yes, there's a need to have a conversation about is the Naira correctly priced, right? Yeah. Because, you see, at the end of the day, whether it's currency, whether it's interest rates, subsidies don't help. And to, your, to the point you were making, it's not really exchange rate stability that you are looking for as a foreign investor. What you are looking for is one, liquidity, which when I want to take my money out, there's I foreign exchange it, available. And protect two, your funds. two is that when I'm coming in, is the currency fairly priced? Mm -hmm. Because remember, if I think that the Naira should trade at 420 mm -hmm. and it's trading at 380, and by the way, these are just hypothetical yeah, figures, right? right? If I bring in foreign currency at 380, 380 I feel like I'm losing 40 naira on every dollar every I bring dollar. in, right? Mm -hmm. And if I don't, if I want to go out and the dollar then moves to the naira moves to 420 where to a dollar, I where I think it should be, mm -hmm. then I've lost money, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I've lost easily 15% yeah. mm -hmm. of my investment, mm -hmm. right? Now, that is the problem. So you've got to be clear that, look, the exchange rate is what I consider fair value. Now, fair value to you might not be yes, fair yeah. value to me. <laughs> but but, but <laughs> if I, we don't want, this is a TV program, so we don't want to get into like technical Technicality. economics, yeah. right? But, you know, the truth is that there are models and processes where you can say, look, this is how I think this is the fair value of the currency, mm -hmm. right? Where you start to equalize these things and you say, look, Naira should trade at this price. The truth is, again, I mean, the, the, the central bank, to be honest, don't have, like, easy... The options, it's the devil's alternative, mm. right? Right. So they're they caught between, a, between they, a rock and a hard place, right? <laughs> but the, the, the important thing for me is that you've got to take, whatever decision you take, you've got to take it quickly. Mm. Because every time you delay the decision, you only make it more painful when you eventually take it. Whether it's exchange rates, whether it's the price of electricity, yeah. whether it's full subsidy, Whatever it is, you've Bites got to try to take, buy the bullet when, <laughs> when, you, when, need to. when you need to. Yeah. yeah, so Aya says we have investments that have come in and government make changes that affect this investment. How do we protect investors even with um, transition, transitioning in government? That's mm -hmm. what the person means. Mm -hmm. Is it mm -hmm. making sure that this is, you know, <laughs> investors are, yeah. Then uh, that's a great question. You want to answer that first before yeah, we take the second that's one? That's a great question. Okay. So, uh, it's a great question because I have the answer for you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, if, I mean, we'll, we'll put up our public private partnership law online uh, very soon. And in my opinion, it's the best in class PPP law, right? Ironclad protection for investors. And look, for most of these things, I keep saying the real protection for investors is government not putting money in, 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 in the business, one. And then, two, following due process hmm. in getting to the privatization point, right? Or the public private partnership. What you find is that if you follow the process, subsequent governments can't unwind it. Yeah. What, then, what happens many times is that people say, hey, we think this thing was not very transparent, right? Then they look through the thing and then they say, oh, well, you were supposed to advertise this thing for two weeks. You didn't, right? So you haven't followed the law that your government was supposed to abide by. Mm. Based on this, we want to mm. revoke this, yeah. this, this, this right? Yeah. So, you have, you need, so one of the things that we're doing is it's not enough to have the laws. It's also important that we have the discipline to follow the process, right? Mm -hmm. So, so, which is why privatization for us, PPPs are not quick. You know, we must follow we're going the through, we're still, look, we're trying to do PPPs for a number of government mm -hmm. initiatives in Ekiti. It's going to take months. Mm -hmm. Some might even take years. But it's important to follow that process because when a pharaoh who doesn't know Joseph arrives, <laughs> right? <laughs> you want to, we want shall to be an octonian. You must <laughs> know that, look, this thing. You can't, it's ironclad. We yes, follow the you process. Can't, you can't come you and can't, twist and it. And that's what gives people confidence. Thank you. Because I, I, I keep saying why a government will come in and the new, new government will come in, everything will just turn upside down. But Ruth says democratize, um, democratizing opportunities is what I believe in. We should be worried if this is not a uh, priority. Uzo says, my take is moving, uh, moving forward, we need clear and transparent processes for driving investment. The Chinese are a largely um, process-driven economy, and this cuts across everything they do. We need to adopt this and talk less. Um, so in, <laughs> <laughs> because you mentioned something about we should be focused on our own export, what we should be taking out of the country. So in your opinion, looking at Nigeria, you know, what do you think are the um, things right now that are like, ready the quick wins the quick wins for us that are ready for the international market people like quick wins no we don't like quick wins no don't put quick wins in my mouth okay that are ready <laughs> what are the things that we priority. think that are priority right now that is ready for for the international market i mean i i i, I again go back to services right yeah. and i think because we've got limited power uh, limited roads we've got an infrastructure deficit that's going to take us years to mm -hmm. to to close I think that our people, you know, resourcing the people, human capital is what you can export, right? And so, and this, this is a period where I, I honestly feel like things like business process outsourcing, especially with the gig economy we're seeing, right? We, we are, we're already seeing these things in pockets, right? So if you sit down with the tech ecosystem today, you know, there are lots of people, some of them are even physically moving to Berlin, to Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, groups of, look, I know banks that woke up one morning and the entire technology team had been hired by some company out of, outside Nigeria. Now, the reality is that you've got to build that ecosystem properly. Right? So you've got to say, let's find three cities. And by the way, we want Adoekiti to be one, right? <laughs> so we've got to say, let's build three cities where 
we can effectively put 10,000 people each, mm -hmm. right? And this is a call center operation, mm -hmm. supporting HSBC, supporting Lloyds, supporting you know who, right? Awesome. Yeah. Now, that's where you build capacity from, right? And then you start to improve uh, disposable income, right? And then you see that standard of living starts to improve. So for me, it will be a service-based economy, right? I mean, and I think that that's one way that you don't necessarily, because that doesn't need ports. Mm. Right? It doesn't need port capacity, right? It doesn't really need, you know, it needs power, but the power requirement is much less than if you were making chocolates, yeah. mm -hmm. you know? Absolutely. Um, so for me, that's where the opportunity is in the short term, right? And those things, because the longer term know-how, you know, in industrial capacity, it mm -hmm. takes, it will take you a decade or more. Mm -hmm. You know, these are things that we can build over, say, a four to five year period. Absolutely. Okay, so quickly because we don't have, we have one minute left. <laughs> one minute. Oh, wow. Yeah. wow. <laughs> we are okay, Akisha, my question is just, you know, talking about human capital, how is Ikiti actually going to um, sort of pave the way for Nigeria? Because I like that Ikiti is one of the very progressive states. And Thank you. I like the fantastic things you mentioned here, almost like, you know, Ikiti should be the blueprint for how Nigeria <laughs> should be run. So in terms of this human capital, how can you set that um, ball rolling so that people can see that it actually works. Okay, so, so it all comes from our heritage, you know, and I say that very proudly, that we're very well-educated people. This is true. Um, you know, professors. I mean, our, our <laughs> professors per capita is very high. <laughs> you know, in my own small family, there are two professors. Um, so that's the heritage we're building on. Like, people go to school. Um, so fairly high literacy rates. What we want to do now is to start to infuse some of the practical uh, lessons that you need in the workplace in university. Mm -hmm. You know, we're investing heavily in renovating our schools. We're investing heavily in getting broadband. So we're talking to the telcos today now to say, how do we get broadband to tertiary institutions? Yeah. How do we then get it to secondary schools? And then ultimately, how do we get it to primary schools, yes. mm -hmm. right? So that's the work that needs to be done. Um, and it's not going to be easy, mm -hmm. you know, but we're committed to it. Um, and by in the next, I mean, the next few months, you know, you start to, look, quick notes to close. We got Max.ng to support the uh, formalization of our transport industry, right? Our motor bike industry, right? It's not because we, we, we understand that we need technology to support government. And the way to bring these technology companies first is by government consuming the technology, being yeah. the first mover, right? Yeah. So it's part of its strategy. You know, we have a strategy that over the next two years, you know, we hope will lead us to be I'm to lead the to country. I Nigeria. I know very quickly, <laughs> very quickly. Um, I just wanted to ask. Um, I can't talk about investment without tourism. Mm -hmm. So Nigeria today, we're on the same strip of the Atlantic mm -hmm. as Sao Tome, Cape Verde, mm -hmm. and the Gambia. Mm -hmm. What can we do? How can we look inwards and partner PPP, whatever? Just start to you know the resorts, the scenery. Yes, what can we do to bank tourism dollars? Um, I mean, I think the first thing is just giving. So, of course, there's some waivers now to hotels. So, this pioneer status covers a part of the tourism. Yeah, part of really? the tourism industry. Yeah, yeah, it does. But the reality is that we also have to democratize this opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. So, we must say that, look, our shore, right? We must say this strip of our shore is open to anyone who can prove that they can do one, two, three, four things. So, in our state, for example, we are currently going through a public-private partnership process on our Ikogosi Warm Spring and Arinta Waterfalls, right? Yes. And we are even building a tourism master plan. So oh. those are isolated uh, situations. Okay. But there's also a proper master plan that says, what's the cultural heritage? What else can people see in neighboring states when they come? Wow. Where do they stay? How do we start to rate our hotels and grade the mm -hmm. hotels, etc.? You know, so so it's a long play. It's a long, we should film an episode of. We have to come to it. Yeah, we actually we have to do that. By the way, you know your your program title is very interesting. You should, if you need a, if you need an opening song, I can send you Yahaya Belo, Governor Yahaya Belo's campaign song. Okay. okay. Have you guys heard it? No. We're not. <laughs> what are you saying? Really? Okay. Okay. We will. Thank you so Thank much. You. you should. You know what? I am We're going to be your speaking. official campaign manager when yeah, you run for president. Uh, no, no, how, how are you no. skipping? How are you skipping? I have no, I have like, no. You have no. <laughs> As of today, I have no. <laughs> no but honestly, thank you so much because That's I just, true. my only prayer is when um, the structure is airtight, you know, another government comes and just follows the Follow blueprint. Absolutely. Absolutely. No need for this, I mean, like, you know, um, disrupting a working blueprint. Mm -hmm. No need to disrupt that. But thank you so much. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank I mean, you. you've been an amazing guest. We hope you come back again. I hope so. I hope you had fun I, I, with I mean, us. Next time you want me, you have to come to Ikiti. 
we will come. That's Definitely, we'll come. That's, that's an invitation. <laughs> All right. So please watch a repeat broadcast of this episode tomorrow at 3 p.m. It's been a very insightful conversation, if I may say so myself. And keep all the conversations going on all our social media platforms at Waysho Africa or at Plus TV Africa as we continue to hear what you're saying. Now, in case you missed today's quote, here it is again. It, the fundamental law of investing is the uncertainty of the future. Yeah, so when... When you know that there's a lot of uncertainty, that's even the best time to actually to invest. Yes. Yeah. So see you tomorrow live at 8 p.m. as we bring another great conversation to your screen. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right.